Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the world's fastest growing martial art and like any sport, there is a chance of getting injured. But what if there were seven principles that you could apply to your life very easily that could offset or negate those chances of getting injured? And although it's definitely quite controversial to say it, the vast majority of these injuries are very avoidable. So let's get after it. The first principle we're going to talk about is something I call close hand training. Now, for some of you that don't understand what's going on here, this is a gi. Jiu-Jitsu, you either wear the gi or you don't wear the gi. And it's called gi or no gi. For me to grab the gi, this is called closed hand training. My hand is closed. So training with a barbell doesn't quite have that carryover that we want. Every single piece of gym equipment has something on it called knurling and the thicknesses are all very similar because these are ergonomically designed, good word, to be easy to hold on to. But when it comes to the sport of jiu-jitsu, that thickness doesn't really give us the carryover, which could be optimal when it comes to hand health, hand training, and offsetting the chances of getting injuries. So for every single person that trains in the gi predominantly, or even any person that trains in the gi, we want to have some kind of transferable closed hand training that is going to allow us to not only make good grips, but to give us good finger and hand strength for those grips. The most common one that's seen is repurposing the gi, the sleeves, or even the lapels to do exercises like chin-ups on. But again, not everyone's gonna have that kind of strength. You can either use your gi or maybe get an old gi and cut some parts out of it. And from here, you could do other kind of movements, utilizing the gi, or maybe even if you don't possess the strength, you might on your pull day or whatever split you're doing, implement some kind of static hold. If you double hard, you might even do one-handed. So it should make sense that for those of you that are training in the gi and want to offset finger injuries, there should be some form of closed hand training. You don't need to use your gi, you can use towels or whatever it is. Now for those of you doing no gi, we need to think about doing open hand training. Because when trying to control our opponent, one of the main things that we're going to be using is something called a C-grip. And one of the most powerful tools you can have is wrist control. And if you can hold on to someone's wrist, you can control them in many ways. Whether it's kimuras, two-on-ones, arm drags, Americanas, wrestling exchanges, the possibilities are endless. But now there's a bit of a problem between the wrist size and the barbell size we went through before. And not everyone has access to a barbell that's thick in their gym, that has transferable skill to having good, strong hands on someone's grip. There's a moment in jiu-jitsu when you grab hold of someone's wrist and they go to pull it away, and then they realize that their attempts was futile. They'll look you in the eyes and you'll see a little bit of their soul escape them, and it's quite a beautiful thing. So to avoid you spending loads of money on this, let me introduce you to what I use for open hand training. I'm not endorsed or promoted by these guys, but you can get these things called fat grips. They wrap around the barbell. Now this is the first size that I use, as you can tell. The thickness of that doesn't quite emulate, good word, emulate someone's wrist, but it gets there. And then these bad boys are the ones that I would say probably have the most transferable thickness to the mere human's wrist. I'm not gonna lie to you, using these is gonna make you feel very weak when doing your normal rows, curls, whatever it is. But although you'll have to use lighter weights and maybe your back and your biceps won't get quite the workout they would, your hands and forearms have to make up for that. And the majority of times in training, it's your hands and forearms that lack the strength, not your lats or your biceps. So any good nogi athlete should have some of these or the bigger ones. It's like the opposite of using this. This, you want to stop your forearms and grip being the weak point so you can work your back and your bi. The fat grips are the polar opposite. Oh, that segment took longer than I thought. Now we're going to principle number two. A white belt with good intentions is gonna cause more damage to your joints and ligaments and your life than a black belt with bad intentions. So I know when it comes to sparring rounds, you look around, you think, oh, I get a good round against this big white belt than I would that small purple belt. But you need to appreciate the more experienced someone is in jiu-jitsu, the probable chances that they can reduce, negate, and really prevent a huge amount of injuries. Whether it's sitting up in 50-50 and your opponent saying, hey, don't do that, that's bad for your knee. Or whether you're putting your hand or your wrist into a position that you shouldn't. Be careful with white belts. And I know you think you're gonna get smashed by the high belts, but let me tell you a little secret about jiu-jitsu that not many people tell you. When a higher belt slaps and bumps fists with you, ready for a round to spar, they will mirror your intensity. So if you are a lower belt or someone new to jiu-jitsu and you don't wanna get absolutely smashed by a higher belt, start that round technical start that round without too much spaz and they will more than often mirror your intensity back but when you come out the gates and you try and lay something on that brown belt or that purple belt or that blue belt they will kill you with the same intensity you take to them so when you're looking to keep yourself safe do not look to the area of the white belts for that to happen 
because there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The less you know about something, the more overconfident you are in that field. And white belts to come to this all the time thinking they know every move, every throw. And there's a reason that higher belts often have selective vision when a white belt is eyeing them up for a roll. Principle number three is to make sure that you're weight training, to make sure you are doing your squats, your deadlifts, your press, your pulls. And if you are going to do them, do them before training. Should you turn up to training pre-fatigued or pretty tired or even knackered, that's good because it now means you need to take more of a technical approach to training and you're not going to try and muscle something that was never on in the first place and pull your back doing so like I did two weeks ago and ended up not being able to train for 10 days. All of the niggles that I get, my shoulder, my back, my elbow, whatever it is, they always stem from me neglecting the weight training and me thinking that I can go down to training once a week lifting weights and it always comes back to bite me. Even if it's a small amount of volume, it works as a good warm up ready for the session. And strength training should be one of your biggest weapons to offset injury, not just from a strength perspective, but from a mobility perspective, I'll explain now. Let's say you're someone that hasn't got very mobile hamstrings. Rather than just hanging out and trying to stretch all the time, I think the best bet is to build strength with that stretch. So if you're someone that wants to work on the mobility in their hamstrings, do Romanian deadlifts. And when you get to the end point in the stretch, not only are we stretching the muscle over loads of reps, with weight, with resistance, which is going to mimic training a lot more, we now get to build strength all the way down to that end range. There was a recent study that came out. Now I don't know what the PubMed link is or the title of it. But bodybuilders doing strength training elicited better responses in mobility than people doing yoga. And there was another study recently that spoke about the idea of doing a stretch at the very last rep of an exercise. Say you're doing a bench press, you do your reps and the last one, you literally just let that weight open your chest and cause slight tears through the muscle to the point that you can't do it anymore and then you drop the weights. Because the muscle fiber is still having to be active, holding onto a weight, something sarcom is, I can't remember, whatever. Basically being under load means your muscle's still switched on while it's stretching, rather than just kind of hanging out in the doorway trying to think that that's gonna build your resistance. Do your weight training, take yourself to end of range of motion. If you wanna do a stretch, do it under load. That's what I'm trying to say. Principle number four, I tell the white belts about this almost every session I do in the gi, I call it let it go bro. This one's for you white belts. Whenever you get like a lapel grip, you hold on for dear life, I see you all the time. And then other people do grip breaks on you where they go to pull your hand away from it and you're holding on so hard for dear life as you come away, you end up like a little claw hand at a scary movie. Let me use my strong hand, child. Only ever hold on to a grip with about 60 to 70% of the amount of strength you have. Is that good for your jiu-jitsu game? Not massively, but it's good for your hand health game. So when someone does a grip break, just let it go. Because let me show you what will happen when someone does a grip break with you. You hold on, they break your grip, you grab it again. Do you know how frustrating that is for your opponents? They do a massive grip break as they pull and they push away and sometimes they get, you just let go, then you grab it again. Oh, look at all that pain. I said never, because I let go of the grips. Holding on like a hero, only messes up your hands. Let the grip go, take it again, in Argy. Principle number five, standing with your opponent is something that everyone should be able to do, but appreciate you can negate a lot of silly and unnecessary injuries by not standing with big untrained individuals, people that are much heavier than you, bigger than you. It's not even that they mean to hurt you, people are just clumsy and not many people have done much stand up. If they've done judo before, don't worry, it'll be over before you know it. If they've done wrestling before, don't worry, it'll be over before you know it. But if you're with some big awkward guy who's never done stand up before, you can just sit and pull guard. And although it might take your alpha status from everyone in the room and everyone's gonna go, <gasps> better that than some unnecessary fall when someone lands on your knee or your foot or your finger or whatever and you hurt yourself. So feel free to slap and bump. But if you're in a position where you getting injured is really gonna mess up your life, just sit, play guard, pull butterfly. So what I do against the very spazziest of the big white belts, I can ensure safety, not just for myself, for my partner. Principle number six, oh my God, this one's gonna seem oversimplified, but tap on time, just tap. If you were against an opponent who is much better than you, understand that tapping helps you. I trained at the B team twice last year. When I was up against Craig Jones, Isaac Michelle, Nicky Ryan, Nicky Rod, I would tap so early because it gave me an opportunity to try and pass their guard again. In a five minute roll, rather than me being stuck in a position holding on for dear life, I got to try and pass their guard 10 times because I tapped easy. I never got past their guard or scored a point on any one of them, but still. So many novices, you get into jiu-jitsu, fair enough, if your arm's bent and someone's trying to armbar you, you protect that. But my chances of getting that armbar here, quite high. Probably could still here. But when your arm goes from here to here, suddenly it's like when you watch poker online and you see that fifth card come up on the river and suddenly their chances have gone from 40% to 5%. But they think, oh, well, I've come this far. 
I might as well stay in the bet when really they should just fold. They should just take their losses because right here with my arm in this position, yeah, maybe there's a 5% chance I'll escape. There's also a very high chance percentage that my opponent's gonna sit back, break my arm, tear my bicep, or even worse. Remember, when the arm is straight, your opponent has really beaten you. Now, they're probably being nice, and when you're not tapping, when your arm is at its full range of motion, they think that you've got very, very bendy elbows or you're hypermobile. And their job from here is more than likely to hip into your arm. When it's here, you've been beaten. Even if you don't feel a stretch in the bicep, just give it up. Because now you get the opportunity to go all the way back up the hierarchy into your passing position or your seated guard, and you can actually work to get onto a proper position from where you are. This doesn't end well for you. It doesn't end well for your training partner as well when they feel bad, when you're leaving with your arm in a sling or being held up by your t-shirt because of your ego. Stop it. And principle number seven is to do with the spine. Now, although we try and promote having a neutral spine during lifts in the gym, the fact of the matter is in jiu-jitsu, you're always concave, you're always flexed, you're always in this position. So I would say don't be afraid to load with a slightly rounded spine. As long as you're strong and in positions, for instance, if you're doing things like zercher squats or even zercher RDLs, you might even be doing zercher deadlifts. As long as you're building strength through sensible ranges and you're not exposing yourself to stupid amounts of load, absolutely train your spine in loaded positions. Awkwardly load it with weight on one side because this is all going to be applicable to jiu-jitsu. Maybe deadlift with your feet in slightly different positions, whatever it is. If you do it with a sensible load, this is only gonna better your body's ability to cope with the demands of awkward and uneven weight around you. When you do things like picking up weighted sandbags off the floor and throwing them over your shoulder, there's no way to do it without rounding through your spine. You can't do things in life with a perfect spinal posture and neutral spine all the time, so don't try. And the last thing that I'm gonna say is don't be too afraid to get injured. Murphy's Law, whatever can happen, will happen. By all means, utilize the principles in this video to ensure that you don't endure any of those silly injuries, but the main thing that you should be worried about with your time in jiu-jitsu is losing your gains. But good news is, if you're wondering how you can balance weight training and jiu-jitsu and not lose your gains in the process, I put this video right here that gives you all the answers you need to. And again, how to stop making the mistakes that most people do when they start jiu-jitsu. I hope you enjoyed that one next. Thanks for watching.